Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for being here uh, to attend this webinar entitled No Pesticides in My Playground Schools and Other Public Areas, organized by, uh, by Pan European colleagues, uh, hosted by several MEPs that will be presented a bit uh, later on. Uh, I'm François Verret, uh, President from Pesticide Action Network Europe. And uh, a few technical things before starting the meeting. Uh, first, you have to know that this uh, webinar is being registered. And that interpretation, thanks to the Green Group, is also made possible in English and German. And you have, you know, the buttons for uh, translation at the bottom of your screen on the, on the right hand side. Uh, we'll have a tight schedule, so I won't be very long. Uh, first of all, uh, why is this webinar? Why do we hold it today? It's very important to understand that this is a, a very important subject. Uh, we, you know, we noticed in the latest edition of the Eurobarometer number 491 from June this year, that uh, pesticide use and other chemicals use in farming was a very important subject for a wide majority of European citizens. Uh, exactly uh, at the EU level, 65% of the panelists people interviewed declared that it was an immediate and urgent problem for them. And in France, my country, it was even more than that, 74%. So uh, pesticide and the consequences on environment and health is a very Hot topic is, if I can say so, at the EU level. And you also know that, you know, uh, up to now, more than 600,000 citizens signed the European C Citizen Initiative, Safe Bees and Farmers, uh, calling for uh, an 80% phasing out of uh, chemical pesticides by 2030 and a complete phase out, phasing out uh, five years after that. So a very important subject for European citizens and also uh, a very important subject as more and more uh, scientific data comes in. Uh, today in Paris, we have a very important presentation by the official uh, medical research body in CERN showing uh, all the effects on pesticides, uh, of pesticides on health, on human health, on professionals, and also on people being exposed by, uh, you know, the, the use uh, in homes or their environment. So this is also scientific subject and we know that at the EU level we have many opportunities to change the situation uh, with many good signs with farm to fork you know, strategy first of all it has a, a very ambitious goal of reducing use and risk of pesticide by 50 percent and we also have the sustainable use directive being revised at the moment uh, that should you know we believe that pan europe strengthen its objective and we also have the opportunity of the EU strategy on the rights of the child 21-24, which is a good opportunity to, to improve the, the EU policy on this, on this subject. So I won't be much longer on that. We have a very long program uh, this afternoon, if I don't get you know, lost in my uh, sheets. Uh, we have uh, many speakers, so uh, I will leave the floor very shortly to the host, to the three uh, MEPs that we are pleased to welcome here. And after that, we'll have a presentation by Kuna Toga on the study of uh, on the exposure of, uh, of children in playgrounds to, by pesticides. After that, we'll have a presentation by Isabel Kolebinov sorry, from Children's Rights International Network on the context uh, of uh, human rights uh, and especially with a view on children's uh, rights. After that, we'll have a, a speech by Mrs. Hairis Abraham from the cabinet of uh, Vice President Brofta Zuka of uh, the European Commission. A presentation from Peter Beckvist uh, on uh, the use of plant protection products banned in sensitive areas in Sweden. Uh, and uh, the latest presentation will be by Andres Kovarik, uh, Slovakia on uh, what has been done uh, to green the policy on glyphosate use in the city of Bratislava. You give us more detail uh, during its presentation. So now I uh, leave the floor to the 
three MEPs uh, that are hosting the meeting. First is uh, pleased to welcome uh, Sarah Vienna from the Austria, from, from the Green Group. Uh, she's uh, a member of the European Parliament since nine, uh, 2019. And uh, as I said, is a part of the Green FR political group. And also, I believe, member of the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development, which is uh, of importance uh, regarding our subject. Uh, welcome also to MEP uh, Jutta Gutland from the Social Democrat Group from Sweden. She's, I believe, a reporter on the third report. So, warm welcome to you also. And uh, to Martin Hoshik from Slovakia of the Renew Europe group is, uh, I understand, the leader of his group on the work on chemicals. So a very qualified speaker also. So uh, I leave you now the floor and the floor is to you, uh, Sarah Wiener, for a uh, short intervention of, uh, let's say, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Vielen Dank, Francine. Ich wollte alle herzlich begrüßen, alle Teilnehmenden, alle Sprecherinnen und Sprecher und natürlich meine Kollegen äh, Jitte Guteland und Martin Heusig, mit denen ich sehr gut zusammenarbeite. Und das freut mich sehr, dass wir da an einem gleichen Strang ziehen. Ja, ähm, vielen Dank für diese Möglichkeit, ein paar äh, generelle Worte sagen zu dürfen, denn der Pestizideinsatz die Pestizidsituation in unserer Landwirtschaft, in der europäischen, aber in der weltweiten globalen Landwirtschaft, ist ein Riesenproblem. Ähm, wir wissen, dass selbst Pestizidabdrift äh, ein Riesenproblem ist, das auch nicht wirklich äh, monitorisiert wird. Zum einen äh, gibt es natürlich die Gründen aus Umweltschutz. Ja, sind, Pestizide sind überall. Selbst ich pinkel Glyphosat. Ich habe das über, äh, untersuchen lassen, obwohl ich ähm, auch einen, äh, einen Öko-Bauernhof habe und mich eigentlich nur äh, nachhaltig ökologisch ernähre. Und äh, dann gibt es das Problem von Kreuzkontamination bei Pestiziden, die nicht untersucht werden. Also wir untersuchen ja immer nur einen Stoff. Wir untersuchen auch keine Abbauprodukte. Wir untersuchen kein Oberflächenwasser. Man muss schon sagen, es ist ein Desaster. Was wir aber wissen ist, dank vieler und zahlreicher Studien, dass die Kontamination mit Pestiziden weltweit zunimmt. Ob das jetzt äh, beim Rindenmonitoring ist oder jetzt äh, natürlich bei dieser Studie, bei dieser wichtigen in Südtirol, äh, die auch heute vorgestellt wird, wo man also äh, 32 verschiedene Ackergifte auf öffentlichen Plätzen nachgewiesen hat und davon 19 auf Spielplätzen aber auch eine Studie aus Deutschland vom Umweltinstitut Münchens und dem Bündnis für enkeltaugliche Landwirtschaft, die gezeigt hat, dass selbst auf dem Gipfel des Brocken, also im Nationalpark Harz, zwölf Pestizide nachgewiesen werden konnten. Also wir sind nicht darüber verschont. Insgesamt sind in Deutschland weit 138 Stoffe, gefunden worden, gemessen worden im Zeitraum von März bis November 2019. Und jetzt kommt eigentlich der wirkliche Skandal, von denen sind 30 Prozent nicht mehr oder nie zugelassen worden. Also das, finde ich, ist ähm, ein echter Skandal, ähm, auch wenn wir da noch nicht mal gerade über die ähm, ja, highly hazardous, also über hochgefährliche Pestizide reden heute, die auch exportiert wird und die wir dann über Lebensmittel und Import wieder auf unseren Tellern landet. Äh, das ist ein eigenes Problem. Also wenn es um Pestizide geht, könnten wir sehr, sehr viel reden über unsere eigene Gesundheit, äh, aber auch, und das wird wahrscheinlich auch heute das Thema sein, äh, gerade der Pestizideinsatz und äh, die Wirkung auf vulnerable Personengruppen, Schwangere, Kleinkinder, auch über das Keimen. Ich rede auch nicht über Amphibien, über Mikroorganismen, ganz spannendes äh, Thema. Nicht nur diese Mikroorganismen im Boden, sondern auch in unseren eigenen Darm, äh, was uns dann letztendlich gesund erhält und unser Immunsystem stärkt. Also, man muss schon sagen, das Thema Pestizide ist ein einziger, ja, ein einziger Albtraum in meinen Augen. Äh, denn 
ähm, auch wenn heute die Pestizidindustrie sagt, so wenig wie möglich, so viel wie nötig, müssen wir doch anerkennen, dass es eine Landwirtschaft gibt, die schon gar keine Pestizide brauchen. Und das ist die ökologische Landwirtschaft. Also es gäbe ja ökologische, naturfreundliche Methoden, die uns helfen würden, eine andere Zukunft zu ermöglichen. Ich rede auch nicht von den immensen Summen von Ressourcenvernichtung von Energie, die einfach die Pestizidherstellung auch braucht und die sich wieder bedingt. Das ist so ein Breitlang von... Ja, von Hybridsamen, von Mineraldünger und dann von Pestiziden, von denen, mit denen man natürlich an bestimmte Zweige in der Agroindustrie eine Menge Geld verdienen können, aber die letztlich dann sehr unfair aufgeteilt sind und uns am Ende in die heutige Situation geführt haben, wo wir am Abgrund stehen. Wir brauchen ein anderes System, wir brauchen ein nachhaltiges System, wir brauchen ein zukunftsfreundliches Modell einer Landwirtschaft und im Umgang mit unseren Tieren, mit unseren Pflanzen, mit unserer Umwelt. Deswegen freue ich mich besonders über die Vorträge, die wir jetzt hören werden, über die Diskussion und bin sehr gespannt, welche Erkenntnisse es geben wird, was man vielleicht machen kann. Ich bin nicht nur im Agri-Ausschuss, sondern auch im Envi-Ausschuss und Schattenberichterstatterin der farm to fork strategie und begrüße den Vorschlag der Kommission, Pestizideinsatz bis 2030 um 50 Prozent zu reduzieren, ebenso den Antibiotika-Einsatz und ebenso den Mineraldüngereinsatz um 20 Prozent. Das sind die ersten wichtigen Schritte. Ich denke mir, es, was synthetische Pestizide anbelangt, könnte das noch besser sein, aber vielleicht kommen wir nachher noch dazu, darüber in, im Detail darüber zu reden und äh, freue ja. mich hier zu sein und bin gespannt, was jetzt meine Nachredner alles sagen werden und was ich noch alles lernen werde. Vielen Dank. Thanks very much, thanks very much, Savina, for this uh, introductory speech. I know uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Jutta Gutland uh, from Sweden, and we are really Looking forward to what you have to say on this subject, knowing that uh, we have a great interest to to see what can be introduced, you know, in the third report. Uh, you are in charge of this report as a, as measures, new measures to, to protect uh, children in, in public areas and other part of the public. So you now have the floor, and I'm pleased to welcome you and leave you the floor for let's say five minutes of introductory words. Thank you very much, Francois, and uh, thank you so much uh, to everyone who participates on this seminar. I'm very proud to co-host this with my colleagues in the European Parliament. For me, uh, I believe that uh, we need to put more focus uh, in, in the political um, arena on pesticides and also on chemicals uh, in general. I believe that we have a uh, big um, task ahead of us uh, and uh, I must say that my colleague uh, did mention um, how important it is and also the test uh, she did uh, to, to show how, how it looks also in, uh, in her body and I would like to mention that my, me myself I also did this blood test a couple of years back Uh, and uh, it showed that the levels of chemicals um, or substances that I have in my body was quite high uh, and uh, that uh, the endocrine disruptors that is surrounding us in our daily lives is affecting us all. I have not lived uh, a life in particular in working with chemicals, but yet uh, the, the levels was quite high. And for those interested, you can... Um, You can uh, ask me and I could show you uh, the, the study that was done uh, with Professor Åke Bergman in Sweden uh, on uh, how it looks today and also the studies he has done uh, taking blood tests uh, on, on different groups and, and he can show that the levels are quite alarming. Uh, and that's why I'm also very interested to uh, listen to the seminar today and take... Uh, 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 notice of uh, uh, what we can do to change the situation. Um, when we have uh, 
thousands of uh, chemicals in our daily lives every day, uh, all of us. Of course, it affects our health. But I would also like to mention that for me, it's also about the ecosystems. Uh, we know that uh, pesticides that are used in the farming sector is, uh, have a huge impact on, on the, the pollinators and uh, the uh, studies that um, have been recently uh, published on this subject really shows that we have a big task ahead of us to save our pollinators and thereby also the ecosystems. So thank you so much, and uh, I will uh, uh, be very interested to listen to the presentations. Thank you. Thanks so much for this very clear speech. Uh, I'm now glad to give the floor to Martin Hovzik from Slovakia and uh, the Renew Europe Group, a uh, specialist of the work on chemicals also in the e European Parliament. So you now have the floor for five minutes. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Francois, and, and uh, really it's uh, for me a great honor to be able to co-host this workshop because the hazardous chemicals and, and the pesticides among them are indeed a, a massive problem that we, that we face as a humanity. Uh, and, you know, going all the way back, if you look at uh, the OSPAR convention, uh, more than 20 years ago, 25 years ago, committed to uh, end releases of hazardous chemicals into environment, and yet we still have a massive problem. Uh, yes, I'm not going to repeat where everywhere you can find hazardous chemicals, in, uh, and uh, including pesticides. Um, back in the day of being an environmental campaigner, we tested the hell out of it. Uh, and it's, it's really everywhere. And I think this is something which is especially a challenge for the most vulnerable groups. Um, and being a father, this is something which uh, it's obvious that the, the children are uh, one of the most vulnerable groups because of the early stages of development being so sensitive to impact of endocrine disrupting chemicals. That's where I feel it's a big loss that we didn't get when we fought the REACH battle, uh, the endocrine disruptors for under the mandatory substitution regime. So that's something which I hope we will be able to look at. But also, uh, it's sad to see how much uh, we have omitted the, well, not us, actually the member states, omitted the proper implementation of the Sustainable Use Directive. And uh, when we're talking about the playground today, I think the Article 12 is something which, if you read it, it says, you know, that it needs to be restrictions or bans on use of pesticides in and around playgrounds and other sensitive areas. And it doesn't seem to be happening at all. I think this is where the Commission has not uh, utilize its powers to actually ensure that the member states enforce the Sustainable Use Directive and maybe, you know, do a, bit, a few more infringements because the situation is in the dire. I want to um, address also one aspect which goes beyond uh, the human health here, and that's soil. Uh, soil is not just a bunch of minerals, but actually it's really... Um, foundation of, of life uh, in a way because it's a unique ecosystem that's being heavily impacted uh, by hazardous chemicals and pesticides uh, above all. And I think this is where we need to look at on providing a harmonized legal framework for soils in the European Union to also ensure the protection of health at the end of the day, uh, including children's health. Now, Today's discussion will be a lot about playgrounds and human uh, and kind of urban environment. I think this is a really important topic because, and I'm sure Andre will talk about it, there is a challenge. On one hand, you see people talking about the need to reduce the exposure to hazardous chemicals. On the other hand, when the mosquitoes come in the early summer, uh, the reaction in Slovakia is often spray, spray, spray. You see a substantial public pressure on the municipalities and on the state they are trying to reduce the, expo the use of uh, pesticides, biocides in this case, ultimately it's all insecticide, the pesticide, uh, and, then, and kind of the, the lack of support from the side of the state, in my view, in ensuring that we actually use uh, integrated pest management. And while I fully support the organic agriculture that Sarah talked about, I think uh, 
we actually are not yet in a position to go fully organic, but what we are in position to do is to go for what's non-organic towards the integrated pest management and to look at it also within the urban environment, including playgrounds, and have the right tools also in the uh, sustainable use directives, supporting municipalities, but also other actors in substituting the use of hazardous chemicals. Because it's not only important to say no or ban, but it's also important to help and create the space for innovation and actually even allow alternatives on the market. I think this is a massive, massive problem. The registration system is actually because it's uh, built for chemicals, not for biological agents. And bioagents are a really important part of the solution. So looking forward to the discussions about the problem, but even more to uh, the discussion about the solutions, because that's what we need to put on the table. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martin, for these words. And you make uh, a perfect link with the next speaker, uh, Kuna Toga from Pan-Europe Board. Uh, and also member of the Committee for Pesticide-Free Village, Marles Venosta, uh, in South Tyrol, in Northern Italy, uh, who is going to present the results of a study he, he, he has co-authored on the presence of uh, residues of pesticides in playgrounds in this uh, region. So you now have the floor, Kuhn, for about 10 minutes. Okay, Francois, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah, thank you very much. Dass ich da anwesend sein kann. Also, thank you to uh, Jutte and Martin for having me as a presenter in this event. I would like to share my screen and show you my presentation. I could actually talk uh, an hour about the presentation, but I'm limited to um, only uh, seven to ten minutes. Um, today, I would like to present this uh, study, which is called Year on Pesticide Contamination of Public Sites Near Intensively Managed Agriculture Areas in South Tyrol. This uh, study has been published. Uh, it's a peer-reviewed study that we published in a journal which is called Environmental Sciences Europe. It has been published the beginning of this year. Um, and I would like to go to the next slide. Um, I talk a little bit about the framing of the project, why we did the study, the contents of the study, and um, then I go into the details. Um, the framing of this, of this project. Um, during the last couple of years, and I'm almost talking about 10 years, uh, the environmental groups in South Tyrol, they took small number of grass samples on playgrounds and public places. Playgrounds as defined in Article 12 of the Directive 2009-128. Um, because there were limited number of um, samples in 2017, we decided that we wanted to do a bigger project with a total number of 71 grass samples on public playgrounds in South Tyrol. This project was privately financed and based on the results of the first um, citizen science study we did in 2017, we were able to put a lot of pressure on the regional politicians in South Tyrol to take grass samples on specific areas, also again uh, related to Article 12 of the EU directive. And this time it was not privately financed, but it was the uh, taxpayer money that was used for um, financing this, this project by the regional politicians in, um, in South Tyrol. <clears throat> um, why did we do this, this study and what was the content of the study? Um, in, after um, the year 2018, in which the uh, local uh, politicians or local institutions took raw samples on playgrounds and schoolyards, um, they took, they took 90, 96 uh, grass samples on playgrounds. Uh, that means 24 different playgrounds at four different times of the year. So they had um, uh, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And uh, after, the study, after their study was done, the local experts informed the people in South Tyrol that there is absolutely no risk and no problem to the, for the health to the children who are playing on the playgrounds, but also the, the pregnant moms who are visiting the playgrounds and also the elderly people. Um, they did not mention any details on the residues they found in the grass samples. So we decided to get uh, our hands on these um, laboratory reports in order to reanalyze um, to reanalyze the laboratory uh, reports from the grass samples in order to verify or falsify the findings. So the finding from them was there is absolutely no risk. 
we wanted to see if there is a year-round contamination in the uh, sensible zones, the specific areas visited by the vulnerable groups, such as children or older people. The focus area of the study was South Tyrol, but the results, the findings of our study can easily be, can easily be um, interpreted for other um, areas in which uh, agriculture fields and living areas are actually interlinked or very close to each other. Um, the the, the reanalysis -anal that we did was uh, supported by uh, a group of NGOs, but we were also uh, highly supported um, by the uh, Ramazzini Institute, which is a, a research institute in Italy. And also very important is that we had the scientific support from the University of National Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna Boku. And you can also see the other supporters. Um, in order to, to show you where exactly we are in South Tyrol, I have uh, presented, uh, I have a slide with a couple of pictures. You can see uh, South Tyrol is an, in the northern part of Italy. You see it on the map and we are uh, close to Austria. We are close to Switzerland. So we are on top of, uh, of the Italian, Italian um, area. And uh, the agriculture is mainly wine production and apple production. On the right hand picture, you can see something that we see on a daily basis. This is the use of pesticides in the apple uh, orchard. And as you can already see on the pictures, there's uh, a lot of pesticides that are sprayed that are not um, reaching the target, but they are spread into the village that you can see on the, on the back of the picture on top. And on the right hand side, you can see a picture of a playground. And in the back of the playground, you see uh, an apple field uh, where about 23 times, 25 times a year, there are a lot of pesticides being sprayed and they don't stay at the same place as we have seen in the, uh, in the study we've done. Um, now I would like to go to the, to the results of, um, of our findings. So uh, as Sarah already mentioned, uh, in our area, we found uh, 32 pesticides and one uh, preservative agent. That means in total, we had 33 different chemicals that we found on non-targeted areas that, that in this case, these were the playgrounds. And what is even more alarming is not the fact that we found, um, that we found these pesticides, but 25 of the chemicals that we found are to be considered endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, EDCs and EDAs, EDA means uh, endocrine disrupting agents. And I have a list of all um, um, uh, agents or all uh, substances. I'm not going to read it, but these are the 25 substances that are being classified as EDCs, EDAs. What is also very alarming is that we found a contamination year round. So it's not only in the times that uh, the pesticides are sprayed on the on the on the apple fields, it's also in winter and in the fall where there's actually no use of, um, of pesticides. We found multiple residues. We're talking about cocktail effects. There's no research done uh, in the European Union on the effects of uh, different pesticides uh, on uh, grass or on food. So the, the cocktail effect is very alarming as well. And then we found a mixture of endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals all of these um, endocrine disrupting chemicals, a lot of them were under the, 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 the they were within the safe levels, the, the defined safe levels. Um, but in, in total, they are causing a problems. And also the problem with the endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals is that there is, um, they, there's no possibility to put safe levels because they can be more, they can be more harmful in lower uh, concentration than in higher concentration. As a result, uh, it could be said that they might be long-term effects due to the fact that there's long-term exposure from the people living in our area. And there's obviously a higher risk for chronic diseases. Um, the local uh, institutions and politicians are not looking into these uh, long-term effects on long-term exposure, as they are always saying that there's no problem. What we also found in, in, uh, in the reanalysis of the laboratory reports is that in a lot of cases, the maximum residue levels were exceeded. What do we mean with this? If we would have found this concentration on lettuce, strawberry, and spinach, uh, these um, this food cannot be sold or cannot be eaten anymore. So if we have identified pesticides on non-target areas as playgrounds, it's most probable that 
This pesticide can also be found on private garden in which lettuce, salad, and strawberry is uh, harvested at the time where they use the pesticides. And the private people, they don't have a possibility to do uh, a sample of their salad before they are eating it, because by the time they got the results, the salad is already uh, not possible to eat anymore. So this is very alarming. Um, over the seasons, as you can see in the next slide, um, as I said, we, we, have, we had 24 different playgrounds at four times during the year. In spring, 83% of, um, of all playgrounds were contaminated with, with pesticides. Um, in summer, almost 80% of the playgrounds were contaminated. In autumn, uh, by the time that uh, the apples and the wine is, is harvested, still 50% is 50% of the playgrounds is contaminated with pesticides mainly uh, from the use in the agriculture and in winter all, all, still 17% of the playgrounds are contaminated and you can also see uh, the colors uh, especially if you look at um, uh, in spring we found 10 playgrounds with more than four different um, pesticides found on on uh, on, on, in the grass. So that's the, the cocktail effect that I was uh, just um, talking about. Um, based on the figures that were available, and I mentioned that we have uh, privately financed a study in the year 2017, in spring 2017, and we were also able to um, compare the 2017 figures with the 2018, as you can see on this slide. Uh, we have the impression, and it's based on figures, that the situation did not improve from the year 2017 to the year 2018, even though um, the local politicians in South Tyrol, they said that they have taken a lot of measures to improve the situation. Uh, in our opinion, this is not an improvement and also an, an uh, initial uh, first analysis that we have done with the 2020 figures, uh, we still do not see an improvement. So all measures that have been taken by the politicians on the regional level, they are not leading to the, to the result of, um, of, uh, of an improvement. Um, I would like to go to the, um, already to the uh, conclusions because I think that Francois mentioned that I have two more minutes left. Um, at, at this time, um, we, would, we would like to thank as well um, the Italian MEP Eleonora Efi. She has been supporting us um, in the past and she uh, tabled a parliamentary question to the European Commission in which we said, um, we have found this uh, contamination of the playgrounds. And if the commission considers using the results of our study in, um, in, um, uh, for the work, and they said uh, they will take into account the findings of this evaluation if they are working on uh, the work that they are doing on the uh, uh, sustainable use directive. So they will be using our study. Uh, I would be pleased to hear or to know uh, how they would like to, um, to use this and uh, what they will be doing because uh, we are able to provide even more information. So we urge the European Commission and the Parliament to a deep revision of the uh, EU Directive 2009 um, 128, especially the Article 12 that was already mentioned before. We need a more ambitious approach in order to guarantee the protection of the vulnerable groups specifically and people in general. One consideration could be the introduction of a 150 meter buffer strip between agriculture fields and these specific zones, but also residential areas should get um, a better attention. And um, 150 meters is a compromise, so it even would need more. Furthermore, I would like to uh, point out once again, the European um, Citizen Initiative, Save Bees and Farmers, is aiming at a huge reduction to ban pesticides within a reasonable transition time. Um, as I said before, my final words, I could talk about this study for one more hour, but uh, Francois is telling me we'll that I need hour. to stop now. Thank you very much for the attention. I'm open for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. And um, above all, I think that pesticides should be banned. Thanks Thank you very much. A lot for this uh, detailed presentation, Kuhn. Cool. Uh, I now will give the floor to Isabel Kolebinov. Uh, and uh, many, many thanks, first of all, to have accepted to replace Basket Tunkak, sorry, that couldn't make it today. 
and you're going to make a presentation on the international context on human rights and chemicals with a focus on children. So thanks very much for that. And I will, by the end of the presentation, I will show you the time remaining with this very technical device I'm in my hand. Thanks. Thank you, Francois. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, and yes, as Francois said, uh, I am here to replace Bashko today, uh, who unfortunately could make couldn't make it. Um, so I do my, my best to replace him uh, to set the international scene in regard to exposure of children and other vulnerable groups uh, with higher risk of vulnerability. So CRINS, which stands for the Child Rights International Network, uh, is a creative think tank working on human rights with a focus on children and young people. One of the thematic area that we work on is the relationships between the rights of children and environmental degradation, including the impact of toxic chemicals on children. So in this presentation, I'd like to um, set the international scene um, and I will be referring to the work that has been done um, by Bashkut Tutkak, uh, former Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights, to demonstrate that this is a children's rights issue and uh, that this perspective could be of good use for uh, European actors to make the change happen. Um, so just to mention that the illustration in this presentation, thank you, Sandra, for putting that, putting that up, are from Miriam Sugranis, who is Queen Art Director and Illustrator. Next slide, please. So first, looking at the health impact of such exposure on children as recognized as the international level. We are all exposed to toxic substances daily, including in, a, in our neighborhood as just demonstrated by the excellent study that uh, was presented. All humans are vulnerable to the effects of, toxic to, of exposure to toxics, but children are the worst affected population group because of their smaller body, um, their rapid growth, and also uh, particular behavioral habits. So two main reports coming from special rapporteur at the UN have looked at the health impact of exposure, making the links with human rights and more particularly children's rights. First of all, the, the report of the special rapporteur on the right to food, which was dedicated to pesticides in 2017. Um, it's, it's, clearly stressed that children are most vulnerable to pesticide contamination as their organs are still developing and owing to their smaller size, they are exposed to a higher dose per unit of body weight. Health impacts linked to childhood exposure to pesticide include impaired intellectual development, adverse behavioral effects and other developmental abnormalities. The reports also mention emerging research that reveals that exposure to even low levels of pesticides, for example, through wind drift or residues on food, uh, may be very damaging to children's health. The same report also identifies pregnant women as particularly at risk and um, and recent evidence even suggests that pesticide exposure by pregnant mothers lead to higher risk of childhood leukemia or other cancers, autism and re respiratory illnesses. Second report that I wanted to talk about is Bashkut's report, uh, the 2016 report to the Human Rights Council, which was dedicated to the, the exposure of to, to toxic of children. In this report, there is, um, the, the, the rapporteur was um, showing that exposure starts before birth through the mother's own exposure, leading to what research, researchers describe as pre-polluted children. He also refers to a silent pandemic when talking about the impact of pollution and contamination on children's health. Finally, just to mention here, the report also refers to the international impact of pesticides being passed down from one generation to the next. And next slide, please. Um, I, I'd like here to, to look at the rights that are that being affected by exposure. So under the Convention on the Right of the Child, uh, children are entitled to uh, live, learn and grow in a physical environment that facilitates health, play and education and is free from undue risk. A wide range of children's rights are being affected by exposure to toxics. 
there is a right to life, the right to health, the right to play, to education, to information. In his report, uh, the, the former UN Special Rapporteur also referred to the right to physical and mental integrity, which is the right of a person to participate in and make decisions about his own body. He explained that non-consensual physical or mental intrusion against the body constitutes a human rights violation. According to the Special Rapporteur, human exposure to toxics constitutes such intrusion, whether this is acute poisoning or low-level exposure to toxic substances. Another right highlighted by the Special Rapporteur is children's right to be heard, which means that every child capable of form forming his or her own views has a right to be heard and to influence decision-making processes that may be relevant in his or her life. This right is closely linked with the question of consent and with the phenomenon of children being born pre-polluted, as I was referring previously. According to the Special Rapporteur, states must prevent childhood exposure in recognition of the right of present and future generations to be heard. So in application of the UN framework, the Convention of the Rights of the Child, states have a legal obligation to protect children from exposure to toxics. States need to prioritize the best interest of the child when designing environmental and public health norms and ensure access to information and effective remedies. Businesses also have a responsibility to ensure that their activities do not violate human rights. Next slide, please. Um, these rights and obligations that I just presented have been stressed in recent UN reports uh, and UN uh, resolutions, so in different UN developments. I'll, I, I just uh, point a few here, which are um, the 2020 report by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, which was dedicated on the realization of children's rights through a healthy environment. This report looked specifically at childhood uh, exposure to toxic and uh, chemical, including uh, endocrine disruptors, and stressed the importance of adopting a prevention as a primary approach. Same in the, in the Human Rights Council resolution uh, that was adapted in September 2020 on the same topic. It also refer and stressed the need to adopt a preventive and precautionary approach uh, it urges states to, to identify and eliminate sources of exposure of children, including endocrine disruptive chemicals. Um, just a quick mention on the current call for global recognition at the UN level of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, which might happen uh, in the next year, uh, and which could contribute to making these obligations even stronger. Next slide. Just want to finish this presentation to make some links with the EU framework that is of interest in this event and to draw potential synergies with children's rights. So as you know, um, and uh, um, just mentioning here the EU strategy that has just been uh, adopted a couple of months ago on the rights of the child. Uh, and I know that Mrs. Abraham will uh, elaborate in a minute on this strategy. So I think this strategy is a great opportunity to ensure that the mainstreaming of children's rights in all relevant policies at the EU level, including on chemicals. Um, it's, uh, so I refer here to a couple of, of um, strategies and plans that interaction uh, and, uh, can be make, made. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, just a last, uh, very last slide please, uh, to thank you for your attention. Um, and if you want to read more about Crane's work on this issue, you can consult our website. And uh, you may also want to visit the full online art exhibition that I, uh, because I only selected a couple of pieces uh, to illustrate this um, presentation, uh, but it is available online. Um, I thank you for your attention. Many, many thanks for this very clear presentation. Uh, I now give the floor to Mrs. Uh, sorry, Iris Abraham from the Cabinet of Vice President Dubrovka Srika, Vice President of the Commission, of course. It, and uh, well, pleased to receive you here, and uh, you have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Thanks a lot. 
merci François. Thank you very much to all and not to, to all the speakers also for the very interesting interventions, uh, the study, and also just to Isabel for her uh, for her expose. And I'm actually very happy to uh, speak right after you uh, to zoom in a little bit more on the European dimension of the strategy. However, the strategy itself, as you've seen, also has a very strong global dimension. So I will start uh, out a bit and then also zoom in very much on the issues at hand today, which are extremely important. So thank you very much. So as you've heard, the EU strategy on the rights of the child, which is actually the first EU comprehensive strategy on the rights of the child that has been developed, was adopted on 24 March. And amongst uh, many of its six uh, key priorities, it clearly recognizes that the early years of life are crucial in shaping the future health. And as we heard, also even before when the mother is pregnant. Um, again, uh, I repeat that all children have the right to enjoy the highest attainable standard of health, as it also been uh, stipulated by Article 24 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And to say that the UN Convention really guides the work of the Commission in the field of children's rights. The strategy is anchored in it, but it's also very much uh, based on the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So the... Um, Debate on the use of pesticides in playground schools and other sensitive areas should also be seen particularly in that legal context that I just mentioned and that uh, my colleague before mentioned as well. Um, it is very much on the radar of the Commission and I'm sure you have seen uh, initiatives that have been adopted this year in that regard, which include also um, action in that particular field. So reducing our dependency on the use of chemical pesticides is actually a key aspect, aspect of the farm to fork and the biodiversity um, strategies that, um, and we really intend to deliver on this aspiration. Both have been adopted actually in the early part of the current commission mandate, which also really shows that this is a priority for us. So um, acting on on these strategies, we are moving ahead very swiftly with a revision of sustainable use of the pesticides directive or SUG. Um, this revision should then help us achieve our pesticide reduction target, which means actually we want to reduce the use and risk of chemical and more hazardous pesticides by the year 2030. And we're very much on target there. It is realistic and it is ambitious. And I think this is really the approach we need because as also the study that was presented before highlighted, there is urgent, urgent action is needed. Now, since um, the directive came into force almost 10 years ago, we have made some pro progress, but we are also very aware that we know that need to build on this progress and that more needs to be done. So what is the next step? Our ambition is to adopt a new legislative proposal on the sustainable use of pesticides during the first quarter of 2022. And with regard to this important issue you raised today, the use of pesticides in sensitive areas such as playgrounds and schools, we already have strong legislative provisions in place. Um, you, this Article 2012 of the existing directive has um, been mentioned before, and this actually already requires member states to ensure that the use of pesticides is minimized or prohibited in certain specific areas such as public parks and gardens, sports and recreational grounds, school grounds or children's playgrounds, but also in the vicinity of healthcare facilities and I quoted the directive. And that also really means that we need to ensure member states step up. The directive is in place and it really meaning a directive, it needs to be transposed by member states. So here's again a call also to member states to follow suit on this directive. Um, that Because this means when member states drop the national plans to implement it, they really must define clear measures to reduce or prohibit the use of pesticides. So this is also the action that we need to see. Uh, furthermore, uh, the legislation that uh, on placing the market of pesticides requires that each active substance and plant protection must be thoroughly assessed before it used, before actually used, it can be used. And this clearly includes the impacts on vulnerable populations and in particular children at a young age, as also Isabel mentioned, their development is, is very much influenced by this, dependent on it, the physical, mental, but also the, 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 the health of, of, the, of children, particularly also when it comes to preventing rather dangerous and impacting diseases. 
Now, the question is, do we need to go further? Yes, I think we need to go further. And that's also the position of the Commission. And hence, um, we are addressing the impact assessment for the REST directive right now. So we are calculating the impacts of different policy options. And with this knowledge, we will be in a better place to make actually an informed policy decision to also have the impact that is uh, targeted to the needs on the ground and the requirements. So all the studies and also the information we've heard today um, that also have, have already been presented to the Commission, we can reassure you uh, that um, they're being taken into account during our impact, impact assessment process. And uh, also call to you if there's any further information relating to this topic which you think should be considered, we would be extremely pleased to receive it. So please don't hesitate to share with us because the evidence and the studies that are being produced are extremely important to inform our policies and we need to base them on this. Um, also in terms of um, the efficiency and the, the, of, of our actions. Um, the final conclusions of the European Food Safety Authority also when it comes to the active su substance of glyphosate uh, will form the basis for the Commission's discussion with member states um, before the decision on the renewal of the approval of glyphosate, which ex uh, expires in December 2022, will be taken. Uh, so again, studies and evidence and research from you and also there is extremely welcome. And with that also to conclude, we really want to thank you for putting a spotlight on this issue today. It is extremely important. Again, the child rights strategy we adopted this year is comprehensive. It also is um, underlined by uh, the principles of equality, of participation um, and of inclusion. And this also really means that um, every child, no matter its background, has the same right and has the same rights to a healthy life, to a healthy development um, as any other child. And I think this is also something we need to take into account as we implement the strategy. And comprehensive means it touches up on all fields, because we've really seen during the preparatory work for the strategy that each and every policy that the B device affects children in one another way, and certainly also those that we are discussing today on pesticides. So um, we know that citizens and also you here expect us to be, to be vigilant, and we will make sure that this issue will continue to deserve our full attention. Um, I thank you again, and also I'm open to, to questions within the coming minutes. Thank you very much. I was thanking you again. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Abraham, for your views, reflecting the position and the initiative of the European Commission. I now hand the floor to Peter Bergvist from Sweden. Peter Bergvist is a policy officer, principal policy officer at the Swedish Chemicals Agency and uh, specialized in risk management of chemicals in food and feed systems. So you, you, have, you now have the floor, sorry, for 10 minutes, Peter. Yes, thank you, Francois, and thank you for the invitation. So the title of my presentation is Use of Plant Protection Products Banned in Sensitive Areas. And I will also give you a short description on how we have made use of the Sustainable Use Directive in Sweden. And finally, give you some of our pre preliminary views on the revision of that directive. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah, but first, sorry, <laughs> just a few words about KEMI and the non-toxic environment. The Swedish Chemicals Agency, KEMI, is a supervisory authority under the government. We are responsible for the authorization of plant protection products and biocidal products in Sweden. And we have been man mandated to conduct and follow up the progress of one of the 16 environmental quality objectives established by the Sweden, by Sweden, by the government in, and the parliament. And the objective is a non-toxic environment. There are a set of milestone targets to achieve changes in the society to meet these objectives. A non-toxic environment aims to ensure that the total exposure to chemical substances via all sources of exposure is not harmful to people or biodiversity. And children's de development and biodiversity are in focus in the action plans we have launched recently. 
So about the sustainable use directive, uh, we think it's an important legal basis for imposing national restrictions on pesticide use. It complements the regulation on the placing of, of plant protection products on the market by focusing on the use phase. It is a non-harmonized legislation allowing member states to enforce stricter rules if justified. So it's up to the ambition in each member state to adopt higher standards. And in view of our national environmental quality objectives, this is very welcomed. It has been of great help for us during the development of new legislations in the chemicals area. And Sweden has used this opportunity in the Sustainable Use Directive frequently during the latest 10 years. So I will show you some examples in the next slide. During the development of the thematic strategy on the sustainable use of pesticide, there was a consensus that it, that it is not possible to achieve a high level of protection only by applying the regulation on the placing of plant protection products on the market. However, I think there are still some misunderstandings on the role of the Sustainable Use Directive among some stakeholders. So uh, these are the examples we have uh, introduced in Sweden. There is um, a ban on the use of pesticides for aquatic weed control, dredging and mechanical weed control in ditches and other water bodies are used instead. We have a ban on chemical soil disinfection. Preventive methods are used instead, such as crop rotation, use of tolerant crop varieties, and avoiding cultivation of susceptible crops in affected areas. We have a post harvest disease ban on post harvest disease control with fungicides on fruit and table potatoes. Um, low temperature and controlled atmosphere in storages have been used instead to slow down the ripening and to control diseases. These techniques have reduced exposure of residues to consumers. We have a ban on pre harvest use of herbicide in cereals for desiccation or late weed control. It refers mainly to glyphosate use, but uh, it has never been used in Sweden. Um, there is also a ban on the use of several different plant protection products containing the same active substance if the maximum dose rate or the maximum number of applications exceeds the provisions for one of these plant protection products. We think this is an important restriction to mitigate cumulative toxicity. However, the initial idea was to cover substances sharing the same mechanism of toxicity, but that was considered a too complex approach from the start. Next slide, please. So the Swedish government has issued a ban on the use of pesticide in urban areas, and it will enter into force on the 1st of October this year. The purpose is to protect the environment and human health, in particular vulnerable groups such as children and pregnant women. women. The ban covers the following areas, schoolyards, courtyards of preschools, playgrounds, to which the public has access in parks and gardens primarily intended for recreation, in allotment garden areas and in greenhouses used for non-professional purposes, in home gardens and on land for residential buildings, on plant indoors except in production premises, warehouses and similar places. The first two points cover professional uses, whereas the following three cover mainly private uses. And I would say the main impact is also on private uses. Next slide, please. So with almost all prohibitions, there is usually also some exemptions and also in this case. <clears throat> so the following substances are exempted and can be used in areas mentioned also after the 1st of October. Uh, Biopesticides, that is microorganisms, um, substances either approved as low risks or have been identified by the commission to be of potentially low, low risk. That is fatty acids, plant oils, pheromones, sulfur, potassium hydrogen carbonate. And we have also included iron sulfate and acetic acid in the list of substances that can be exempted from the ban. And 
why they are com common chemicals. They can be used for other purposes, and when we think they can be used uh, uh, safe in, in these areas. Um, according to the criteria we now have put in place, the following substances can no longer be used in specified areas. The herbicide glyphosate and three insecticides, pyrethrins, acetamiprid, and flupiradifuron. I should say also there has been several, several restrictions introduced in the past for private uses. In general, there are also quite a few substances allowed to be used in home gardens in, in Sweden, in urban areas. So the new ban will extend the provisions, the previous restrictions further. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the preliminary position of, of Sweden on, on the revision of the Sustainable Use Directive. Sweden welcomes the revision to strengthen the implementation of the Sustainable Use Directive, especially regarding integrated pest management. We also propose to extend the scope uh, to include biocidal products. We mean this could be justified for at least some product types that are used in the same manner as plant protection products, for example, insecticides. Biodiversity should be promoted by adding provisions on the protection of terrestrial compartments, pollinators, etc. The main focus in the directive is now on aquatic compartments. Further minimum requirements regarding certain uses can be included, as is already the case with the ban on aerial spraying. For instance, a ban on soil disinfection could be elaborated in this context, we think. The provisions on national action plans need to be clarified and developed. The reduction of the dependence of pesticides could, for instance, have a more central role to play in the present sustainable use directive. Now it says that member states shall encourage to use alternative approaches and techniques to reduce dependence. We also think, I mean, there are a lot of member states that are uh, uh, have raised criticism about the present uh, indicators. So we think they need to be improved to better reflect the use intensity. Uh, for instance, we propose to use the number of hectare doses instead of the used volumes. So these are preliminary positions from, from Sweden on the revision. I think that was the last slide. Yeah, thank you for your, your attention. Many, many thanks, Peter, for your presentation. Uh, we have a last speaker on the panel before the round table. Uh, Mr. Andre Kovaric. Uh, you are, Mr. Kovaric, uh, plenipotentiary of the mayor of Bratislava, Slovakia, for the environment. So. Uh, we are now listening to you and explain what was done in Bratislava uh, on public areas with pesticides. You have the floor for 10 minutes. Yeah, thank you very much for, for your word. Uh, it's very nice to be at this forum, which is uh, very important these days as we, as we all are speaking. Uh, I would start to uh, talk about, about uh, activities we uh, try to achieve as a city. Uh, within this field, and I would talk about uh, on basically glyphosate, and then I will talk about little about uh, bioregulation of the mosquitoes. And uh, yeah, we when we actually started in 2018, we uh, of course looked for our uh, possible option as a municipality, and this is actually uh, quite a narrow field as uh, as we. Mm, as we find out, because unfortunately, for example, city of Bratislava is quite a complicated, co complicatedly divided into uh, several city districts with uh, their own responsibilities and uh, uh, and possibilities to to manage this. So, as a city, we we, we set basically some uh, 
uh, example how to deal with uh, ban of glyphosate, but because especially glyphosate, uh, yeah, we'll try to start uh, to share the presentation moment. He's here. I made a mistake by saying that you had 10 minutes, it's only five, I'm afraid. But yeah, I'm yeah, I'm mistake. counting. Five. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, as, we, as we started with this, uh, mm, try, we just tried to base, uh, to ban actually glyphosate, uh, we started with uh, quite uh, uh, badly said mindset in, in minds of people, and me, I mean in minds of people that were actually dealing with this management in the field. Uh, uh, the, ha the habit was quite bad actually to use glyphosate, for example, for management of public spaces like sidewalks and, uh, and roads. So of course, uh, within our competencies, we uh, immediately banned the usage of the glyphosate actually with uh, only one exception, which is for use for management of invasive alien species, such as Tree of Heaven, which is a really big problem also in Bratislava. And uh, yeah, the, these spaces we uh, have been able to manage this way, have been, uh, it was uh, more than uh, 500,000 uh, square meters of sidewalks and road within this maintenance. We changed it, for example, for uh, uh, physical, uh, uh, removal of these uh, these plants, except of uh, chemical treatment, and uh, yeah, we al also banned uh, uh, all of the uh, glyphosate usage and pesticide usage in our city forests in some uh, in some uh, more than three thousand hectares of them. And we also, uh, yeah, this is important to say. I think uh, if if we try uh, in general to uh, to limit usage of, of uh, pesticides there are, there are very good ways how to do this and it is via support of uh, uh, natural ecosystems of, of or natural habitats especially if you have uh, uh, such uh, in uh, quite a good condition you can really ban this usage also in case of uh, spreading of invasive alien species that's why in the city forests of Bratislava which are located uh, within the Carpathian part uh, we uh, have been able to do this, but we are not able to do this, for example, by the localities like uh, Danube and Morava rivers, uh, uh, because uh, they are much more problematic for spread of these invasive alien species. And uh, yeah, uh, another, uh, I would say, very important activity uh, is uh, uh, our change attitude to regulation of the mosquitoes. Uh, previously, uh, after I would say each bigger flood in uh, Morava or Danube uh, floodplains, we usually and uh, very commonly have this uh, calamity situation with really a lot of mosquitoes. And in the case of Bratislava, of course, we have a lot of um, quite a big influx of uh, new people of, uh, from our surroundings, from Slovakia and from all over and these people are really not able or not used to meet this situation so they can be surprised after a few years when the flood comes back and the normal situation come back, comes back also with the mosquitoes and we had this situation right after beginning in 2019 after really uh, seven years of drought and uh, the discussion around was really very complicated and uh, to actually pursue the change of this attitude uh, from the public within the public discussion was quite uh, yeah it was a huge communication challenge also and uh, it is still partially problematic uh, in terms of public acceptance actually people itself and also some uh, mayors of uh, city districts and uh, the towns and villages in surroundings they really used to go all the way so just to spray after the after the calamity or after the floods which of course repeatedly uh, we have them like every second uh, or every third year so it, this is something what uh, really tried to totally change the attitude and uh, the mm, beginning was very hard because uh, actually 
of course the management of the expectation if the uh, in the in these teams especially if you have city uh, lying on the flat plain forest uh, it is very hard so uh, it is also about the education and the explanation that we actually are able to manage these uh, populations we are able to lower them but of course the aim is not to eradicate them uh, at all uh, or uh, eradicate them totally so in in um, in reality you we will have still a lot of a lot of them in the field uh, despite of activities that we are communicating communicating actually we chose the biological method which is called uh, BTE uh, based on bacillus tumbergensis israelensis which is the agent which uh, disrupts uh, the digestive of the of the larvae it is uh, highly selective so we are really focusing just for uh, hatch uh, sites where uh, the hatcheries have li larvae and of course uh, we try to wrap up this team and to, to have some uh, international support also so we uh, have been able to join the uh, Interreg uh, Mosquito Bioregulation uh, project within uh, which we are trying to have some cross-border unification and of metal methodologies and approaches within these teams uh, because uh, especially uh, for example city of Bratislava lies at the borders with uh, uh, Austria and uh, Hungary and uh, uh, borders with Czech Republic are not far, not far away and in each of these countries these uh, methodologies um, are actually totally different it differs even within the region so that's why maybe uh, it's an interesting question also for eu level especially with the new uh, species uh, invasive alien species also of the mosquitoes that we are able to uh, uh, monitor within this uh, new technique of monitoring not only the hatchery hatcheries but we also monitoring uh, the adults and of course with these new uh, species um, my personal fear is really what uh, what level of public um, acceptance of some new biological method would be if we gonna to, gonna detect some problematic uh, pathogens, for example? And I think this is uh, already problematic for southern part of, parts of Europe, and it would be nice to have some uh, comprehensive approach for countries that are, I would say, newly touched with this uh, kind of problem. For for uh, imagination. Yes, you uh, now, Andre, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually yeah uh, almost finished. Uh, this year it will it will be spent some more than half million euro for this uh, BTE. And just for your Im imagination, we have some five uh, one thousand five hundred uh, special uh, individual sites that we are monitoring. And yeah, just to conclude, I think uh, really more biodiversity support activities such as changes in moving, grazing, revitalization of the uh, floodplains or, or small uh, streams as greening, less pesticides needing. Thank you for my, for your attention. Thanks very much for this uh, presentation, Andre. And uh, well, we just had two very interesting presentations showing all the initiatives going on in Sweden. In Slovakia, and that could be added added to other initiatives in Belgium and uh, in my con home country, France, where a law was passed, thanks to uh, Joël Labbé, French senator, that forbids now all synthetic pesticides used in uh, areas uh, open to the public. That includes public gardens, schools, etc. So, uh, building on all these initiatives and examples, real practical examples and now we can discuss so all these points in the round table we have about you know 15 to 20 minutes to discuss that with uh, a question to our guest MPs what do you think uh, that could be done you know, to improve the actual situation what could the European Parliament build on the example and building on the examples of Belgium Sweden and France do to strengthen the rights uh, for the health of children to diminish uh, uh, at the maximum, their exposure to pesticides and especially what could be done in public places. So, uh, you know, have our three guests the floor uh, to answer these questions. Please, uh, Sarah Wiener and colleagues, wants to speak first on your opinion on what can be done in the parliament to improve the situation in the actual context. I'm happy to start. Um, Go ahead. So, 
first of all, thank you for the for the insights and the presentations. Um, I have to say, yes, uh, we should look at how to kind of ensure the the uh, and emphasis the, pro uh, the kind of protection of uh, children's, but of essentially general uh, all of the human rights uh, and get it more transposed into regulation. But at the same time, uh, what I'm seeing is that, uh, especially in terms of the sustainable use directive, what we have as a challenge is a, is a lack of uh, proper implementation. So here it's going to be crucial to make sure that A, the language is stronger, and B, the commission is obliged to um, act when it's not being fulfilled. Uh, and of course, we need to also be, uh, review the pesticide regulation. And we need, uh, then on a practical terms, two things. One thing is, as I said at the beginning, really change the approach, how we are permitting biocontrol uh, agents. And this is something I've been in contact also with the city of Bratislava, which is struggling in some um, ways to obtain some of the, uh, some of the biocontrol uh, substances or, uh, or tools because of the regulatory blockade. And I think this is uh, something that definitely needs to be addressed on, on a Europe-wide level because we don't have the right assessment system. And second is the experience sharing. We do not have sufficiently equipped platform for experience sharing on how to actually uh, substitute uh, or phase out the use of uh, chemical pesticides. Uh, and this is something where having the more tools will enable us also to be to be more restrictive and be bolder in in the restrictions and the enforcement so uh, i would like to see more happening on, on these fronts and of course it will be also up to us in the european parliament uh, to see it keep on pressure on the commission to come up also with the pesticide regulation uh, recast but uh, uh, and as well watch the, the Sustainable Use Directive and keep on pressure on the Commission. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, Sarah Vienna, do you have uh, a reaction? Ja, vielen Dank, Frau Saar. Uh, vielen Dank an alle Rednerinnen und Redner für diese spannenden Vorträge und diese neuen Erkenntnisse. Um, Es ist so, dass ähm, man natürlich auch sagen könnte, äh, wir äh, tun den Einsatz in Pestiziden an öffentlichen Plätten komplett äh, verbieten. Das wäre, finde ich, äh, doch angebracht. Und wir brauchen ein Update von den Richtlinien zur nachhaltigen Pestizidbenutzung. Äh, Aber wir brauchen auch dringend eine Risikofolgeabschätzung äh, für Pestizide. Nämlich auch nicht nur äh, für einzelne Grundstoffe, sondern gerade auch für den Cocktail-Effekt und für die Abbauprodukte. Das fehlt nämlich jetzt wirklich. Ähm, ich wollte aber noch etwas erwähnen. Wir reden über in erster Linie über eine Reduktion von Pestiziden oder von einer Einschränkung von Pestiziden. Das können wir aber nur führen, diese Diskussion, wenn wir auch über nachhaltige ja, landwirtschaftliche Methoden sprechen, die Pestizideinsatz dann überflüssig machen, zum, zumindest für synthetische Pestizide. Es kommt ja immer oft das Argument, wir verhungern alle, der Ertrag im ökologischen Anbau, der sinkt so sehr, dass es nicht konkurrenzfähig ist. Ich möchte darauf hinweisen, dass allein in den Tropen der Ökoanbau 174 Prozent mehr Ertrag hat. Und es geht auch nicht immer nur um eine Ertrageffizienz, sondern es geht um resilienz, äh, resiliente, stabile Ernährungssysteme und um eine Landwirtschaft. Ähm, das heißt, besser mit der Natur, äh, wieder mit der Natur in Balance kommen, als also diesen Weg weiterzugehen und das, was jetzt die Pestizidindustrie vorhat, Einfach Smart Farming, das Grauen für mich, verzeihen Sie, dass ich das so sage, 4.0, jetzt gezielten Pestizideinsatz durch Sensoren, durch Drohnen, durch Software, also eine größere Technologisierung, anstatt aus der Natur zu lernen, eben mit den ganzen natürlichen Methoden, die es ja schon gibt, denn 
Ökoanbau heißt ja nicht einfach, wir lassen jetzt mal alle Pestizide weg und schauen der Natur zu, was sie da macht oder nicht macht, sondern es heißt einfach in der Balance mit der Natur einzugreifen, die Natur zu unterstützen zu dem Ergebnis, das ich haben möchte. Und da gibt es noch etwas zu erwähnen, das möchte ich in dieser Diskussion sagen, ist, wir reden auch meistens, wenn wir über Pestizideinsatz reden und über Alternativen, über einen Vergleich von industrieller, agroindustriellen, konventionellen Flächen versus agroindustriellen, ökologischen Flächen. Ich möchte hier anregen, den Austausch dahingegen zu erweitern, dass wir alternative ökologische Systeme bereden, die jetzt noch gar nicht so richtig auf dem Tisch liegen, wie Agroforest, Permakultur, Mikrolandwirtschaft, von der wir wissen, dass sie viel, viel effizienter, also ertragmäßiger sein kann, bis zu zehnmal. Auch da gibt es Studien, zum Beispiel aus Frankreich, als diese Monokulturen und die großen agroindustriellen Flächen, die wir jetzt haben. Das ist jetzt, wir müssen natürlich etwas an den Direktiven verändern. Wir müssen aber gleichzeitig auch holistisch denken, also nicht nur ein Glied rausnehmen oder jetzt Glyphosat ist ja sozusagen der, der Feind und dann kommt eben das nächste, das nächste Grauen, das vielleicht dann auch noch, noch wirksamer und noch giftiger ist als Glyphosat, sondern wir müssen wirklich holistisch, gesamtheitlich und interdisziplinär denken, um diese Probleme von allen Seiten anzugehen. Und da haben wir ja ein großes Beispiel vor Augen und das ist einfach die Natur. Arbeiten wir mit ihr Hand in Hand, dann sind wir alle glücklich. Thanks very much for this world. Uh, I wanted to hand the floor to Jutta Gutland, but I understand she's not with us anymore. So we, if there are no specific questions, I understand we have a question from the public, from Stefano Mani, uh, who wants to raise the problem of insecticides from veterinary use uh, with the example of pet colors containing imidacloprid, for example, or fiproid, fipronil or the Uh, that also a problem for health of kids and as a way of having them exposed to pesticides. And uh, I don't know if someone wants to say a word on this uh, question from Stefano Maini. I understand it's well. Another, uh, Soll ich uh, etwas dazu sagen, gerade das hat ja auch viel mit der von der Kommission in der farm to fork -Strategie, strategie geforderten Reduktion von Antibiotika-Reduktion auf 50 Prozent ähm, hinzusetzen. Ähm, das ist ein Problem, weil wir äh, den nächste sozusagen das Damoklesschwert, das über uns allen schwebt und leider muss man so sagen, schweben ja viele Schwerter über uns mit vielen vielerlei Krisen, sind natürlich multi- oder mittlerweile auch panresistente Keime, ähm, die gerade auch aus der Massentierhaltung kommen, also Fipronil beim, äh, bei, bei Legehühnern und so weiter. Ähm, das ist aber auch ein Problem, möchte ich ansprechen, weil das ein Thema ist, das mich sehr interessiert, ist, äh, dass Reserveantibiotika, ähm, die eigentlich, also bestimmte Reserveantibiotika sollten nur in der Humanmedizin eingesetzt werden. Ähm, die Kommission hat jetzt äh, in, der, äh, in der Veterinärverordnung ein, ein Papier vorgestellt in den letzten Tagen, wo es aber ein großes Schlupfloch gibt, wenn man nämlich sagt, wenn Tiere ähm, äh, sagen wir, gefährdet sind, also äh, ich, ich kann jetzt nicht den, äh, wortwörtlich den, den Text sagen, dann darf man auch Reserveantibiotika äh, wieder bei Tieren einsetzen, was ja alles wieder ähm, äh, äh, unnütz macht, sagen wir mal so. Ja? Also Reserveantibiotika äh, sind eine wichtige Sache. Man muss halt dann schon sagen, also möchte ich am Ende den Hund meiner Oma oder meine Oma retten, wenn es hart auf hart kommt. Und deswegen hat natürlich also in die Massentierhaltung, so wie wir Tiere 
äh, halten, aber nicht nur halten, sondern auch züchten, sehr, sehr viel dann letztendlich auch mit, äh, mit diesen Problemen zu tun und natürlich dann auch wieder mit Pestiziden, weil sie einfach nicht wesensgemäß gefüttert werden. Also das ist, äh, wie gesagt, eine Kette, von, äh, wo jedes Glied seine Fehler macht und am Ende haben wir dann die Probleme, die wir heute diskutieren. Thanks a lot for this answer. Uh, we also have uh, MEP Irene Tolere wants to ask, uh, the public wants to, to ask a question. So you now have the floor, Irene. Uh, thank you uh, very much. My question was um, uh, that, in fact, uh, as uh, Martin said it, we have uh, discrepancies inside the European Union. There are a lot of uh, countries that do not even have uh, traceability of uh, the use of chemical pesticides. However, I uh, am a bit um, worried on a, a special aspect is that uh, uh, we don't want chemical pesticides because they are bad for the environment and bad for the health. But uh, for instance, uh, glyphosate in France has been replaced on public lands by uh, acid pelargonic. And uh, we do use uh, tons of acid pelargonic and uh, it's really on the increase at the moment. And uh, are we sure that in, uh, acid pelargonic is uh, good for the health or good for the environment? And so my question is, uh, how do we ensure that we have a level playing field inside the European Union on the traceability of uh, the, the movements of pesticides to prevent transborder buying? And uh, how do we uh, make sure that uh, we have, uh, uh, we follow Uh, the impact of the development of non-chemical pesticides to prevent uh, problems if some of them are bad for the health or bad for the environment. Thanks very much for this question. Very precise and technical. Wants to answer that? Maybe I could uh, say something about uh, pelagonic acid because it's uh, one of the substances we have exempted from the ban. I think that the Commission has uh, um, used some criteria for low-risk low substances and, and they have come to the conclusion that pelagonic acid can be considered a low-risk low substance. Uh, but of course it depends on how it is formulated and I, I think it's an irritant substance of course so you have to be take care uh, for yeah for the ice uh, for instance and uh, so there are, of course, risks. Mm. The only thing is whether these risks are acceptable or not. I mean, it's uh, the other question. So the, the risk was non-existent while the uh, use usage was uh, small. But if you multiply the usage by 16, then mm. you have a big quantity. So mm. something that is low risk when it's uh, not used or very mm. little use, is it still uh no not risky when you mm. use a lot mm. yeah i agree so i think the main question is that's why we also think that uh, the um, possibility to reduce dependence on on pesticides is the most important aspect of the sustainable use directive and that aspect could be strengthened we think now it's only up to member state to encourage the use of alternative techniques, etc. But uh, yeah. Thanks a lot for this uh, question and answers. And I now give the floor to Mr. Stefano Maini, who asks the floor. If you can please intervene. Yeah, yes, but uh, I'm not uh, sure that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. you can. It's okay. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I just um, ask um, about the the color of pets uh, that is full of uh, insecticides, uh, uh, not just uh, regarding the antibiotics in veterinary use that uh, we know the, the problems that they can uh, uh, be later on people also. Uh, usually you, you can, in the advertising, for example, in TV or something like that, you you can see uh, children together with animals uh, that uh, use this color very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, there are um, 
uh, insecticides like uh, imidacloprid, uh, uh, pyrethroids, uh, okay, these are less uh, dangerous for humans, but also fipronil. Um, so I, I think that this uh, use in veterinary still uh, to be uh, banned in some way. Uh, this is just uh, my, my opinion, of course. <laughs> Thank you a lot for asking me, for listening to me. Okay, fine. You're welcome. Uh, I think uh, some sort of answers are, has already been made. Uh, I have a look at the clock and I, I can see that it's half past three. So I guess we are reaching, nearly reaching the end of this webinar. I don't know if uh, we are, we have more or additional answers from our MEPs on what they intend to do to improve the, for example, the sustainable use directive to strengthen the, uh, the limitation uh, of uh, pesticide use in public areas to protect children. It's uh, now we have a few remaining minutes to, if you want to clarify, your thoughts and positions and add some more details on the specific accept aspects? Just, just that I think it's, it's really going to be about maybe looking on how to make the language uh, in the Article 12 stronger and uh, then create a mechanism how to enforce it. The, this is something where it's really important to see what the Commission has done and how to how to ensure that the Sustainable Use Directive finally gets implemented. Because I think that's where the foundation of the problem lies. But of course, that means uh, use, we will have to look at the tools uh, that we have at disposal towards the Commission. But yeah, they, they are coming up with uh, uh, a new uh, proposal in the autumn. So. We'll probably wait for that to see what's what's coming up and then talk with them in prior to the publication. Um, can can I reply to to the remark from from Martin? Um, the article twelve itself, in 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 my opinion, it's it, it's a good article. It needs to be stronger. And what I have seen is by the time let's say by the time the sustainable use directive arrives in the member states, for example, in Italy. It, it got weaker and weaker because they seem to have uh, some room for interpretation. And even though in the legislation it says something, the practical side, what we see every day in, in, in South Tyrol, what we see in, in Trentino, what we see in, in other areas, also in Germany, it, it, it's, it's, it's getting weaker and weaker and nobody's showing. And what are the instruments that, that citizens or that, that we can use to, to point out that there is an issue? Because um, what, what, what is difficult for us as a, as a citizen is to know where can we post our, our problem. If we have a problem with Article 12 or the interpretation of Article 12 in Italy or in South Tyrol, where can we go? We can point it to the Commission and the Commission says in the parliamentary question from uh, Eleonora Efi, they said, okay, you have to go to the relevant institution in the member state. So we need a stronger instrument also if citizens have a feedback on a legislation which is obviously not not satisfying the local or the regional needs. This is something that we definitely need. If I may just a brief note on it, that's, that's where um, what is important if you think that at two levels, one thing, if the Italian law in this case is not being properly implemented, it's Italian thing. It's a domestic thing which is then commission. Commission is right to say go and complain to your authorities. Now, if the Italian law is not properly implementing the uh, Sustainable Use Directive, that's a European thing, and that's where the complaint should be going to the Commission, that the Italy has not put in practice uh, the law according to what has been agreed on the European level. So I think this is where it's very specific where the actual problem is. If the Italian law is correct, then, you know, it's the Italian government or local government that's actually breaking the law. If, uh, and you need to complain that if it's not, um, sorry, if it's correct, then it's kind of the practice on the ground and you have to ask the, the Italian government 
to deal with other competent authorities in Italy. If it is not right, then it's a matter on the Europe to be handled at the European level where a complaint to the Commission should be uh, going. And uh, but it's a standard standard procedure. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Can I just Come in. Sorry, I was struggling to with my computer to plug my microphone on. Yes, so you're welcome, very welcome to for a few words of conclusion, please. Thank you, Francois. Oh, I just yeah. wanted to say something on the strengthening of Article 12. Yes, short intervention before the conclusion of Isabel. Please. Yeah, very simple. We should uh, get into more details about what member states should tackle to uh, uh, minimize or prohibit the use of pesticides. For instance, uh, you do not build schools in a place where the schools or playgrounds can be uh, subject to pesticides. Uh, you uh, uh, must uh, uh, make an impact assessment of uh, the, 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 the pesticide usage. So to strengthen Article 12, I think we need to give it more details. Thank you for these last precisions. Isabel, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Just wanted to conclude quickly uh, uh, and just to say that uh, this webinar, it, it was really a start for uh, including more uh, the children's rights perspective. And I really look forward to working more with the European Commission to really improve um, the, the protection of, of children, health and rights. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity um, and for the organization of this uh, webinar. Thank you. I want to, to thank you myself and add my thanks to you, Isabel. Thank you again, the, the host of this uh, webinar. As I have been, uh, you had a good lunch with Martin Hotzik that made the, the meeting, the webinar possible. I think you all understood that it's a key public health issue to protect health of the public and especially health of the more fragile and the younger, the kids from pesticide spraying in public area, but also sometimes coming from the nearby fields as Kuna Toga has shown in his study, because we also need to protect uh, the global health of our children, you know, not uh, from pesticide wherever they come from. So we have now uh, a lot of work ahead and I'm confident that the, in the coming, you know, uh, opportunities in the Sustainable Use Directive and other rendezvous at the EU level, this should be taken into uh, account uh, to improve the various uh, regulations and laws for better protection of public health and children's health. So thanks a lot for taking part in this webinar. And uh, I'm looking forward to speak uh, with you all again and uh, and to to to, to have more collaboration on improving these regulations for better protection of public health uh, regarding pesticide exposure. Many, many thanks and uh, goodbye to everybody. Thank you as well. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.